Yeah, and um, I just want to see, uh, you guys are from what ba background? Who is from uh, engineering? Nobody. Med medicine. Uh, are you guys lecturers? What? <laughs> lecturers, okay, lecturers. So are you all from education? Okay, who's from education? Okay, who is from uh, so social sciences? Yes, everyone is social scientist here. Okay, w where are you from? Uh, wh where are you? And I'm Tuesday, I'm a food technologist. Food technologist, great. So actually, I, 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 will, I will just try, you know, this is supposed to be very interactive, and um, I have to really rush through because I was given only 30, 30 minutes. So v very quickly, I will try to keep the gist of it. I, I'm going to pick on engineering education here since there are no engineers in the room. So let me just try to show you this. Uh, any familiar face in this picture? Nobody. Have you heard of Andy Grohl? He's the Intel CEO? The guy second from right? We know Apple only. Right, you know only Apple, okay. Okay. Do you know this guy? He's, he, he's Walmart CEO. He's actually an, an industrial engineer. You know this guy? I don't know. He's, 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 yes, he's, he's, he's CEO of McDonald's. He's an electrical engineer. Yeah. You guys like McDonald's, right? No. You don't like McDonald's? Your kids like McDonald's? Yeah. Yes, yes. Great. You thank the engineers for that. Okay. You know who is this? So, so he's, he's the CEO of, of GM. He's, he's an engineer as well. You would know this guy, right? Come on. Yeah. So Carlos is also an engineer. He's CEO of Reno and Nissan. Do you know this guy? You should know this guy. Yeah. He leads a company that made a tablet that's blue in color. Ah, yes. And he's, he's an engineer as well. <laughs> yes, he's an engineer. Yes, he's Pfizer CEO. Yeah, the tablet. It's, it's good, right? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. This guy is the CEO of the Boston Consulting Group. And he's an engineer as well. He's a chemical engineer. Procter and Gamble, CEO is 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 engineer. Actually, the list the list is very very long, and and as a matter of fact, this is this is the ad that we do for 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 my school, and 33 percent of the CEOs of the world top 500 companies are engineers. Uh, we did a study, and and the same trend is in Malaysia. And, and so this is, this is an indication that at least, at least engineering education is doing well, supposedly. But y y none of them is, is as famous you know, as, as some other uh, figures. So I would like to say that education has a dark side. And the dark side is, you would know who's this. But he's a dropout. And you know who's this? And he's a dropout. <laughs> and you know who's this? And this guy also is a dropout. Yes, yes, yes. So what does that tell you? You know, what does that tell you? He, yeah, all of them are, I mean, at least did well. Yes, yes. So, so what are the observations? I think we are able to educate good graduates. We are doing a very good job at that. And I think we are also able to educate very good graduates. These people who, you know, make the world go, go around. But great, world-changing graduates, or, or people rather, seem to be happen despite the system, not because of it. So there seems to be something. So just imagine if, if, if Steve Jobs stayed at Reed College, maybe you would not have the Apple and the iPad. Maybe if, and, and not if, for sure, if Bill Gates stayed at Harvard because he went to his professor and he told him, I want to go and play with the microcomputers. And the professor say, Bill, 
finish your electrical engineering. These are just toys. These small the microcomputers will never pick up. These are just toys. But he decided to drop out and go to California to work on the computer. So actually, if this guy did not drop out, maybe we would not have the computers that we have, we have today, and, and, and so on and so forth. So what does that tell you? I think I have, I have mainly two observations. I think we have a very good system that can, in a way, provide the disciplinary specific knowledge to, 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 to produce very good engineers and doctors and social scientists and people who are able to, to take us through. But when, it, when we talk about creating what has never been, creating the new thing where we need collaborative skills, communication skills, innovation skills, and so on and so forth. Somehow, education system, not only here, anywhere, everywhere in the world, seems to be lacking. And, and maybe we don't have people who are able to teach communication and collaboration and innovation and entrepreneurship. So these are, these are my, my, my major observations. And before I go on, I just want to introduce two concepts to you. Some of you maybe already know them, but they are going to be very, very important to what I'm going to say. I know you guys are expecting me to talk about MOOCs, but I really wanted to set the ground for what I'm going to say. So a black swan is, is, is a bird, but a, a, a black swan is an event as well. So for centuries, all swans were observed were white. So whenever you, you think of a swan, you will think of a white bird. And all swans are white as a statement remained true for centuries. And it was supported by millions of observations. Every new swan we see is still white, and that sort of reinforces that image until one day in Western Australia, a black swan was observed. So when the European went to Australia and they saw a black swan, they were shocked. And suddenly that statement, all swans are white, became false. Because not all swans are white. Now, why I'm saying this, because black swans also are events that are highly unpredictable. And, and there is a book by Nassim Nicholas Taleb I highly recommend it for you to, to read. It's called The Black Swan. So he, he talks about black swan as events that you can never predict, and they will have a huge impact on the way we do things. So 9-11 nine, nine is, is, for example, uh, is, is, uh, is, is a negative black swan. Financial crisis. You know, something no one can predict is, is a negative black swan. Uh, Google is a positive black swan. They didn't know that this search engine is going to be that successful. Facebook also was started as something, you know, a student project. And it, they, they never thought it's going to be that successful. So it's a positive black swan. If, if tomorrow you find a gold mine in your house or something, this is something that you didn't even plan, but it is. A, a black swan, a highly unpredictable kind of event. Uh, Twitter is, 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 is the same. Now, so now we, we know what's a black swan. So I want you to keep that notion in your mind for a while. I wanna, I'm, I'm, I'm getting very quickly, so uh, bear with me. I want, I wanna talk about fragile systems. I actually requested something from Prof Karim and he has uh, gracefully brought it for me. <laughs> These are for me. What, what's, what, what is fragile? Easy to break, right? So when there is, okay. When there is stress, it breaks. So anything that when, when there is stress breaks, it, we call it fragile. So these eggs, you think they are fragile? What do you think is gonna happen to them if I drop them? Oops. Uh oh. Okay, so this is an example of fragile system. Now, my question to you, what is the opposite fra of fragile? Strong. Strong. 
Rigid. Rigid, robust. 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 OK, strong, rigid, robust is the opposite of fragile. I would like to say that this is not true because fragile is what breaks when exposed to stress. The opposite of what breaks is become stronger. So the opposite of fragile should be something that when you stress it, it becomes stronger. Something that when you attack it, becomes stronger. That's the opposite, because the opposite of cold is hot, not warm. So in a way, robust is something in between. Now, again, I'm quoting Nassim Nicholas Taleb. He coined this term that he called anti-fragile. And the anti-fragile is a system that gets stronger when stressed. So he sees this as a continuum. So this end is a fragile system, like the egg. The other end is a fragile system, is anti-fragile system. In, the, in between is robust, something that well, nothing will happen to it when you stress it. Now, are there really systems that are anti-fragile? I would say yes. So from an engineering point of view, the arc as a structure is actually an anti-fragile system. The arc is gets stronger when you load it. When you put load on the arc as a structure, it gets, it gets stronger. So this is actually the cover of the book that's called Antifragile. And complex systems can be antifragile. Biological systems, for example, are antifragile. So when, when, you attack, when you attack bacteria, what does the bacteria do? It becomes stronger. Uh, uh, you, you attack them with antibiotic, the, the new generation will become even resistant to that uh, antibiotic. Uh, culture is, is anti-fragile. We try to attack culture and see what happens. It, people will cling to it even more. Ideas are, are, are anti-fragile. You go and try to attack an idea and people will, you, you ban a movie and see what happens. Everyone wants to watch it. So this is an example. Information is anti uh, anti-fragile. So I have an exercise, Midnight's Children. This is the title of a book. It's a novel. Have you heard of it? Some, some have. Who, who heard of it? Show, show of hands. Okay, three people. Oh, you've heard of it. Okay, you haven't. Okay, so, so, so those who did not hear of it, I'm sure you don't know who the writer is. So you would know the writer because you've heard of it. Okay, so don't, don't, don't say it first. Now, this guy has written another book. It's called Satanic Verses. What's the name of the writer? Salman Rushdie, everyone knows now. Why do you think Salman Rushdie was famous? Why do you remember this book? Did you read this book? You didn't read it, I, maybe you didn't even read it, but that's what made him famous. And what, what made him famous? Uh, and why he had the publicity? Be because there was a fatwa against him, and there was a bounty on his head, and everyone's saying, oh, this is very interesting. I want to read that book. So, so, so you try to ban a book. I'm writing a book. Please ban my book. <laughs> because I, I'm sure it's going to be a bestseller by virtue of someone is banning it. So, so now you know the writer. And why? Because ideas are anti-fragile. And when they attack, they get stronger. So I, I want to give you examples. The airline industry is actually anti-fragile. Even when uh, an accident happened, which is very uh, unfortunate and very bad for the people who are involved in it, it actually make the entire system even more uh, uh, anti-fragile. So people will go and make changes. As a matter of fact, as we speak, because of the MH370, things have changed already that will make the airline system uh, air safer. Every air crash makes the entire system safer. Small errors and mistakes will benefit from them by correcting them, and, and the system becomes um, uh, stronger. Uh, Post-traumatic growth. You know, it's, it's now uh, proven that people who have difficult experiences they have growth after that. It, it, it's actually good for us to be stressed as people, to have difficulties in life. It will make us 
better, make us stronger. Why? Because we are anti-fragile at, at heart. And if you tell someone a secret, say, please don't tell anybody, that's the best way to actually go and, because that's how, information is like that. You, you try to hide it, everyone wants to know it. So if you, want, if you want your students to read maybe something that you've written, just say top secret, and then I think they'll read it. Yeah. So just try that, just try that. So these are examples of anti-fragile systems. What makes a system um, uh, anti-fragile? When a bank fails and the government bails it out, the entire system, then we have a bigger bank, and the bigger bank may fail, and then we keep on bailing out the banks. This will create an anti a fragile uh, situation. While if we have infection in our body, and we let the infection take its course, that will build our immune system. Now, we as a, as a, as a body, we could make ourselves very fragile. So every time you have a little bit of fever, go and take a course of antibiotic. But one day, you will reach a stage that, you know, uh, you will have a new infection and there's no antibiotic for that and, and maybe a simple thing could, could knock you down. So infection is actually a very good thing in a way to a certain extent for the human body and it will reduce the fragility that is in the system. Now, I want you to look at this now. I'm bringing back the black swan concept. So the x-axis represent time, the y-axis represent the gain and the loss. Now, if, if a system Sometimes there's gain, sometimes there is loss, and if there is a loss, and the loss is a black swan, there is a possibility that you are going to destroy the entire system, then the system is considered to be fragile. So this is an example of a fragile system. There is no possibility that you have a huge gain, but there is a possibility of a a sudden kind of huge loss with a black swan. So this is considered uh, uh, a fragile system. Now a robust system will always be a bit of gain, a bit of loss, nothing much happens, and will continue uh, like that. Now an anti-fragile system is a system where there'll be some loss, there'll be some gain, but if there is a gain, then the, 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 the impact could be, could be huge. So for example, if I'm a writer, and I keep on writing about uh, very controversial things. Sometimes I attack the Vatican, sometimes I attack the government, sometimes I attack, then, so maybe I'll make some money, maybe my book is not, but one day, if they will ban my book, then I'll become a bestseller, and then all my other books could actually pick up. So this is an example, just an example of how to make a system um, uh, anti, anti fragile. So this is, this is, these are the two concepts that I really wanted to introduce. The black swan, which is something that uh, you, you don't plan it, you cannot even predict it, but it will happen, and it has been happening, both positive and negative in, in our life. And the, the, the notion of a system being either fragile, like the egg that I throw, or anti-fragile, like ideas and, and, and things like that. Now, we have a choice of being Fragile, robust, or anti-fragile. That's what I would like to uh, talk about, and I'll connect it back to, to our, our, uh, our, our MOOCs and things like that. Wind extinguishes a candle because the candle is fragile, but wind energizes fire because fire is anti-fragile. So you try to, to you know, blow the fire, you will, you will even make it stronger. You blow a candle. So do we wanna be a candle or do we wanna be a fire? There is, there is actually a, a choice here. So how to make our graduates anti-fragile? And that's maybe something that we are all interested in. That's why we are here. How to make our education system anti-fragile? That's, that's the, question, the question. Because I believe personally that being fragile is not an option. There are so many challenges out there, global challenges, that we have no choice. We have to be anti-fragile. We have to be ready for all these black swans that are going to to happen. Now, to, to make our education system anti-fragile, we have to encourage small failures. And this is something that is very interesting because we have built an entire education system that glorified success. We want our students to go 
and, and especially our better students, they don't take risk. They actually find a way so that they get even a four flat CGPA without taking any risk. So how do we create that education system that encourages failure? So for example, what I do in my school, we, 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 do, we use project-based learning and I want the students to go and think out of the box. And one of the ways that I, uh, I, I, I started doing uh, recently, because I noticed that especially the better students, they will always play it so safe that they will give you the project that you want at the end of the day, which will just you know, meet all the requirement, follows the rubric very, very closely, and you, you don't have any other choice but to give them a good mark. So I said there would be a 10% of the course that is for failure. So you have to push the limit, fail, and write, there is a form that I call it return on failure. So you have to show me that you have pushed the paradigm and you failed. Just like Edison failed when he was trying to make the light bulb. And then through this, you will, the, the greater, the better the failure, the higher the mark that you are, you are going to get. So now, a better student for him or her to keep their they're you know, very good CGPA, they need to fail. And, and that's just an idea, but I'm, I'm sure there are other ways to, to do it. W we need to teach entrepreneurship, and my, maybe this is the thing that got uh, the Ministry of Education interested in the MOOC that I'm doing about entrepreneurship. And, and we, we need to uh, teach multiple intelligences. So, you know, we are intelligent in a cognitive way, but what about the emotional intelligence? Do we teach our doctors, our engineers, our economists uh, emotional intelligence? Which is another MOOC that I've done, and I think people are interested in it. Maybe that's maybe the reason why I'm talking to you today. So, so these are things that we actually could infuse into the system, and through that, we make our graduates uh, anti-fragile. Anti so, let me talk now about the, the MOOCs and why I think they, they can help us uh, make the system anti-fragile. Um, you see, it's very easy, I think, or relatively easy, to get someone to teach thermodynamics or uh, to teach maybe e microeconomics or macroeconomics or whatever. But I, I find it very difficult to, to teach entrepreneurship, to teach innovation, for example. There are very few people who can do that. And if we can, through technology, through the MOOCs, scale up that. So if we have few people who are able to engage bigger classes, utilize the size so that they could have it as, as a mechanism to teach their, their students, then there is a real opportunity to scale up the excellence that is maybe available in, in, in small, smaller pools and make it available on, on a much, much bigger scale, maybe a national, a national scale. Now, the MOOCs uh, are, uh, okay, I'm making an assumption here. You guys know what MOOCs are, right? So MOOCs are massive, open, online courses. These are courses that thousands of people take. Uh, and it's, uh, anyone can take them. So, I, do, I also believe that having successful, massive open online courses can brand Malaysia as an educational uh, destination. L let's face it, we are all fighting over which one is the best university within Malaysia, but if you go outside Malaysia, I, I asked Richard, Richard Buckland, he's from University of New South Wales, I, I told him, have you heard of Talias before? He said, no. I said, have you heard of USM? He said, no. He, people didn't really hear of us. Now, now, also let's face it. I know of owners of private universities, vice chancellors of very good universities who send their kids to study overseas. So we, we are not really well known for education, but there is actually an opportunity for us to brand Malaysia to attract international students because through this, they, there are people who don't know that we speak English in, in Malaysia. This is a fact, and, and I think through putting our best professors out there, we could say, look, this is a good place to be, 
and, and it's a nice place to be and, and to study. Now, MOOCs is an anti-fragile opportunity for Malaysia. Reason is, I think things can go, can go only in a, in a positive direction. So I, I'll, I'll give you an example. No one heard of Taylor's University. I put a, mo a MOOC out there, and let's say I fail. Still, no one has heard of Taylor's University. But if I put a MOOC and the MOOC is a hit, people say, oh, Taylor's University. I have some work with MIT, and um, a professor over there told me, Mushtaq, I think uh, your work with us has really benefited you. I say, why are you saying this? He said, if someone asks me what is the best university in Malaysia, I will say Taylor's. Do you know why? I say why. He said, because it's the only university I've ever heard of. <laughs> now that's a fact. Now, there are people that we pay, they come here to do it, then, and they say, oh yeah, this, you're, you, you guys are great, but we, we didn't really establish the name out there. Uh, now, MOOC could be a threat to an established university. Uh, if, 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 if the university has the reputation that it's a great university, but they put lousy MOOCs out there, people say, hmm, I thought this university is good, but if this is their best professor, I think we can do better. So this is actually could be a negative black swan for them, but maybe we don't have much to lose. We have only things to win. Now, I'm not saying only, we, we need to do only MOOCs, but because this talk is about MOOCs, then I'm, I'm, I'm introducing it to you as a, po a possible positive black swan for us to, uh, to a as a country, as an education system, to brand ourselves even, even overseas. Now, so that's what I said. So MOOCs at Taylor's, I just wanna quickly go about, uh, we, we deployed the first MOOC, Entrepreneurship in April 2013. The, 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 the MOOC attracted 2,000 plus students from 125 different countries. Uh, the MOOC that we deployed, you, you know, MOOCs are plagued with a very low completion rate. And ours was at least three times the, the, the global uh, completion rate. So that was, that was really good. Then we deployed another one which is called Success with Emotional Intelligence. And, um, and uh, it, it has almost 2,000 students as well. The final MOOC that is actually running as we speak is called Global Entrepreneurship. Currently I have 1,329 students, that as last night. And we have more. So the, the MOOCs that we have are here. You see the first three MOOCs, Entrepreneurship, Success, Global Entrepreneurships are mine. And these are the numbers that I have, uh, I have put there. But the university has, has started other MOOCs as well. So we would like sort of to brand ourselves as the leaders in, in, in this space, and we're working very closely with Open Learning, and I think Adam will, or, or Richard will speak to you later about that. Now, I just wanna say a few words about Global Entrepreneurship MOOC that I'm running now, and why I think it's, it's different. So every student from Taylor's will have to have a team from the online community. So no one student from Taylor's can work with a person next to him. They have to go out there and recruit students from the, global from the global MOOC community. And the teams need to come up with an entrepreneurial project and they will need to raise funds for that project. Everyone will have to raise funds, otherwise they won't pass the course. And they will need to use crowdfunding. Have you heard of crowdfunding? Okay, so crowdfunding is a, a, a new technology, a new technique that empowers the, crowd, the crowds. Uh, if, you, if you recall uh, how President Obama uh, won the election, he actually raised more money than any other president in the history of the elections of, of the United States. And he did not go for people and say, can you give me a $100,000? Uh, he actually went out through the website and say, anyone can support my campaign. And you can pay $10, you can pay $5. Now, by tapping on the millions of people, not only from within the United States, but people from outside the United States, who thought he should be the leader, he managed to raise a lot of money. So this is called crowdfunding, and the idea is very simple. Let's say I wanna make this device, and that device costs eight ringgit, but to make it, I need to have an order of a thousand of these pieces. I go, there are some, some platforms online, and possible.com is the one that I'm working with, and I'll say, look, I really wanna make this. This is a very cool device. I make a video about it and I say, if you order one now, when we reach an order of 1,000, I'm going to sell to you 
for $10 each or 10 ringgit each. So people, if they really want it, they will pledge. If they don't want it, then you actually know that there is no market for this, for this device. So every one of, of my students will have to come up with a possible.com uh, campaign, raise money, and, and, and uh, eventually uh, deliver the value that they have, uh, they have uh, promised. Um, you know, how much? I, I'm, I'm running out of five minutes. OK, so, so uh, I do an exercise on the MOOC. It's called brain rewiring. So everyone who joins my MOOC have to rewire their brain. And the brain rewiring is, <laughs> happens when, you know, all our brains, every brain in this room, apart from my brain, because I'm rewired already, uh, is, is created to detect negative stimuli. So if there's anything that's dangerous or non-comfortable, your brain will just pick it like that. The brain is not designed to pick the positive things that's happening in our life. And that's why we are unable to see opportunities at times. So if I say to Prof Karim, tell me a thousand things that are right in your life now, he said, what do you mean? The plane was late, the crowd has left, the people are gone, the vice chancellor is this. You know, he will remember the negative things because that's how the brain is wired. But if we keep on remembering the things that we are grateful for, then after, the research says after maybe three to four weeks, real physical change in the, in the brain is going to happen. And that's the thing that everyone on my MOOCs is actually uh, uh, doing. Uh, so I will give you some example. Now this is a very long example. This lady is from Portugal and she did the brain rewiring. The gist of the story, I'm, I'm going to pass the slides later for, oh, let's just read it. Victory, victory, victory. You may remember that I shared with you how my daughter is on a mission to divide and conquer every day and, uh, and that she's often annoys me so much that I just wanna, I let you fill in the blanks. However, yesterday was great day. Even though I came home tired with a bit of headache and just wanted to sit down and stare into the thin air, I took a deep breath in and I told myself that I was going to smile no matter what and try to meet her on her premise. And thank you, Phoenix Slam, this is another student, for reminding me that she is not annoying me on purpose. She's just being authentic and true to her emotions. Oh, the change. Everything went smooth, even when she still didn't want to do what I had asked her something ali alike. I didn't get angry. I was in touch with myself and my emotions, and whenever I felt anger on its way, I just took a deep breath in one of many. Stayed patient and moved on. No tears, no anger, lots of smile and love. I turned everything around, even got her to eat cauliflower, and that is a record, cause anything from the green side is her enemy. And today, I did it, again. Told her that I didn't want to get mad or upset at her. I wanted us to be good friends, and therefore, I need her help and would like her to do what I say. She looked at me, smiled, and said, okay, mom, done. So this is an example of what, what one of the students, uh, she's from Portugal, who, who did that. Now, this is, this is an amazing story. This is one of my students, his name is Paul, he's from Africa, and he told me because of the MOOC, he was able to confess his love to, the, to this lady. <laughs> I'm serious, he sent this on Open Learning, and he said without this MOOC, I would have never you know, uh, go, go, made that decision and, 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 and move on. Now, this is a very long ex example. This is actually an 18-year-old student on campus where she said brain rewiring have changed her life. This is the latest thing. This is just last night. Uh, uh, Asma Harb, she's a Palestinian, but she lives in the United States. And just read number five. She, you see, I, I prevent people from using the P word, P-R-O-B-L-E-M. The P word, you cannot use it within my, within my MOOCs, and you have to change it with opportunity. That's, that's another uh, tool for, for the MOOC. She say, these are the five things that she's grateful for. So you could, positive energy in the MOOC, whatever, yeah. Number five, 
We, my husband and I, had an issue at home today, and I implemented the opportunity rule instead of the P word, and he liked my idea. Way to go. So these are things that are happening. People are exchanging it. People are helping each other as, as we speak. So my final remarks is education system is actually either in the fragile or in the robust kind of uh, uh, domain. And we, the more anti-fragile components that we introduce into the system, the better. So the MOOC could be make a, a way to make it a bit anti-fragile, but there are other things. And the more component, the more anti-fragile component that we put in, components that are open to positive black swans, the more the system becomes uh, anti-fragile. Uh, uh, anti uh, I just want to warn you that the MOOCs on open learning are addictive. So if you, if you get into this, you will have very little sleep. You will keep on like, you know, attending to people from all over the world, tagging you and asking you questions and things like that. But my final thing is you can always scale up excellence if it exists in the first place. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Such a uh, very uh, delightful talk that is trying to 